Good evening. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to tonight's candidate forum for the Sequoia Union High School District. My name is Adam Dawes. I am the publisher for the Almanac and the Redwood City Pulse and CEO of the Embarcadero Media Foundation. I wanted to start out by thanking the candidates for coming tonight. Um, school board is one of the most important institutions of our community and I want to applaud everyone for raising their hand and being willing to serve and I look forward to listening to all of their uh, direction on where they would like the, where they believe the the school district should go um, the almanac has served these communities for over 50 years, and we have really prided ourselves on the quality of our fact-based journalism. And it is imperative that everybody understand just how difficult this process is of creating community journalism. We do not serve a large market, but we have all of these professional journalists that spend their days serving the community. and want to make sure that everybody understands and recognizes the valuable that role that they play, especially in times like these when everybody is trying to find uh, important information to make a decision at the ballot box to make democracy work. So our team here has been working tirelessly these past few months, collating information, gathering, reporting, um, synthesizing all of this together into our voter guides. So I would highly encourage you as you, before you uh, engage in the balloting process to view our voter guides at almanacnews.com and rwcpulse.com where we have information not just on the school board race but all of the uh, council races, the initiatives. So just a wealth of information and I'm very proud of what the team has done. Uh, let me now hand this over to our moderators, Angela Swartz, who is the editor for the Almanac, and Jennifer Yoshikoshi, who is a staff reporter for the Almanac. Thank you. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we want to welcome you to the Sequoia Union High School District Board of Trustees Candidates Forum. Um, again, my name is Angela Swartz. I'm the editor of the Almanac, and I will be your host tonight. Uh, Midpen Media Center is live streaming and recording tonight's forum on YouTube. Um, joining me is my colleague and education reporter Jennifer Yoshikoshi. Um, tonight we are pleased to have all six candidates who are running for the school board this November in Area B, which includes parts of San Carlos, Redwood City, and Belmont, in Area E, which includes Bellhaven and East Palo Alto. We want to give you the opportunity to hear directly from the candidates on key issues that will help you decide who would best represent your views on the school board. For Area B, we have Daniel Teronium, Mary Beth Thompson, and Jacob Uriev. For Area E, we have John Bryant, Maria Cruz, and Tonga Victoria. The Almanac began in 1965 with the goal of bringing community news to Portola Valley and Woodside residents. It's since expanded to covering Menlo Park and Atherton, as well as news from across the county. We want to provide the community with accurate and re reliable information so that you can decide how to respond to the issues that impact your daily lives. You can find our election guide at almanacnews.com slash election. If you could please silence your phones, that would be great. Um, now I will hand it off to my co-host, Jennifer. Thank you. All right, let's get to the instructions. We'll have a time limit for responses, and we're going to ask the candidates to wait until they're called on before they answer each question. We will be keeping track of time and let candidates know how much time has been allotted for each question. Answers will be 30 to 90 seconds, depending on the question. In our forum, we wanted there to be a little more discussion. Candidates will be able to challenge each other on questions if they do not agree with another candidate. They will have one opportunity to do so. The candidates can challenge any candidate, even candidates who are not running in the same district. They will have 45 seconds for their challenge. Once a candidate is challenged, they will have a 30-second rebuttal. When candidates would like to use their challenge, they should signal moderators, and they will speak after the current speaker. This first question is going to be sort of an introduction to the candidates. The candidates were all given the same three questions to choose from weeks ago. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the question they chose. 
The three questions they had to pick between were, how did your high school experience shape you into the person you are today? Give us three reasons that made you decide to run for public office. What is your personal motto and what experiences shaped you to adopt it? We'll start with Area B candidate Mary Beth Thompson, who chose, give us three reasons that made you decide to run for public office. After her, we will go to Daniel. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for hosting tonight. I'm honored to be here. I chose to run for the Sequoia Union High School District for three reasons. The first is my son. I'm a mother. I have a three-year-old, and I want to make sure that the district is prepared for when he's in high school one day. The second is I believe there should be an educator and an administrator on the board. Diverse perspectives are what bring us together, but also help keep the ship running in the same direction. And so for me, being an educator and an administrator was extremely important to bring that voice to the board. And the third reason why I'm running is because I have dedicated my life, my career, to helping students find success. And I found that this avenue of public service was a calling as most public services, even when you get into public education. And so I wanted to make sure that I could help more students find the success both in high school and out of high school. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Daniel, who chose also give us three reasons that made you decide to run for public office. After him, we will go to Jacob. Thank you. Pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Uh, my journey to being on the stage with uh, these other fine individuals was threefold. One, it's clear to me that there is a trust divide that is occurring between parents and the school district. And I think bridging that divide takes a unique skill set of being unbiased, unfeathered to any constituency, data-driven, collaborative, and a proven track record of being able to solve complex problems. Two, Based on my 44 years of professional experience, I feel like I know very well the skills and the attributes that it takes for our students to be successful in this ever-changing and complex world. And I wanna bring that experience to the students of Sequoia Union High School District. Three, we live in a very unique environment in San Mateo County. The fourth wealthiest, if I'm not mistaken, county in the country. We have Silicon Valley to our south, and we have some of the largest leading pharma companies to our north. Our curriculum and the performance of our schools should be indicative of that dynamic. And we should be ensuring that our students have the benefit. Oh, thank of you, Daniel. Okay. Or past a minute, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Now we go to Area B candidate Jacob, who chose, how did your high school experience shape you into the person you are today? After him, we'll go to John. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. And I chose this question because my high school experience is still fresh, to say the least. And I think that what my high school experience taught me is that a high quality public education available to every single student is extremely important in raising our next generation. I had an absolutely amazing time due to the amazing teachers and faculty and ability of our public school district to serve. I also, during my time in high school, had the unique experience of being able to serve on this very board where I found out and further learned how we still have a lot of ways we can improve. And I think that it's extremely important, during my time on this board, I learned that it's extremely important to ensure that every single member of our community and every single one of our students is served as best as possible. Thank you, Jacob. Now we have John who chose, what is your personal motto and what experiences shaped you to adopt it? After him, we'll go to Maria and then Tonga. Thank you for being here. Um, I wanna thank um, the newspapers for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, my name is John Bright, and my motto is education for all. I believe that we all need some level of education growing up in East Palo Alto and also going to schools in Palo Alto. I've seen how education can transform lives 
and I've seen how access to education has transformed a lot of my peers' lives. So I would uh, also like to see that education is uh, equitable for all students and that uh, being an educator that we're able to teach to all students, making sure that we're meeting them where they're at and making sure they're excelling. Thank you, John. Next, we have Maria, who chose, give us three reasons that made you decide to run for public office. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm honored to be here with this panel of people tonight. Um, I am a strong supporter of education, and I'm committed to improving um, retention and graduation rates. That is what I do um, at San Jose State University as a professor right now. I am a mother of a current freshman uh, in Mendel Atherton, so the stakes are high for me, but I, I don't want to just make um, things better for him, but I want to make better things better for all students uh, in, our, in our county. And I also want to prioritize uh, learning more about how funds are allocated and where they're allocated, particularly for underserved communities such as East Palo Alto and the Ravenswood District. Um, I hope to help our district um, increase retention and graduation rates at all levels for all students. And that is, those are the three reasons I'm running. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Tonga, who chose give us three reasons that made you decide to run for public office. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, um, Almanac, for hosting us this evening. I would like to say that Area E also includes North Fair Oaks. Um, and I think that's a valuable addition. Um, so three reasons why I am running. For the last 10 years, I have been doing the feeder pipeline work, working primarily with Ravenswood um, and also our students that end up at Menlo Atherton, Claremont, Sequoia, Woodside. And some of the things that we've been doing there are We've served nearly 2,000 youth um, around youth leadership, mindfulness, um, behavioral health. I've also been able to design and implement nearly 20 programs across our neighborhoods of Belhaven, East Palo Alto, and North Fair Oaks. Um, and then also, kind of in my capacity over the last 10 years, I have either worked directly or partnered with um, every youth-based nonprofit um, in our neighborhoods. And so uh, with a deep network of educators and community partners and parents and students, of course, uh, this is why I am deciding to run. Thank you. Thank you, Tonga. Okay, for this section of the forum, we'll be asking the candidates our questions. Candidates were not informed of the questions ahead of time. Candidates will answer the questions in a rotating order. After this round, the questions asked will be based upon those submitted by the audience. If during this round, you want more information on something about a candidate um, or think of a new question, please write it down and put it in the back table. Um, and then you're gonna hand them to Arden over here. Um, there are uh, pens and pieces of paper at the back of the room. Um, and for those watching at home, um, you can go to tinyurl.com slash sequoia-board to submit your questions. Um, for this first question, candidates are gonna have one minute um, to answer, and we're gonna start with Daniel followed by Jacob. Um, here is the first question. Board members have the ability to request certain topics be brought to the board's attention. If you were elected, what is one of the first topics you would request to be brought to the board, and what are you hoping to accomplish by doing so? So starting with Daniel, you have one minute. I think in my travels, the issue that I feel like I hear the most about is detracking. And I'd want to make sure that we are having a very substantive, data-driven discussion on whether detracking is appropriate or not, not appropriate. I want to put aside my personal biases. I want to hear from educators. And I also want to obviously hear, hear from parents because it is very impactful if we are considering removing honors or AP classes for those who are coming in at the freshman and sophomore level and then waiting for that to occur at their junior year. So I think that that is a conversation we need to have soon and in a very transparent and data-driven manner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we will move to Jacob. If I were to explain my educational philosophy in one word, I would say data. I think that at the end of the day, 
in order to best improve our public school education for our students, we need to pay attention to what the data and information is telling us. And the data is telling us that recent course changes are not helping our students. And at the end of the day, our role as a public high school system is to help our students and provide the best possible public high school education. So one of the very first things I would do is ask the board to review recent changes to courses and really make sure that we're focusing on listening to the community and listening to our students and providing all of our students with the most high quality education and the most academic opportunity that we possibly can because that is our role as a public high school district. Okay, thanks Jacob. Um, Mary Beth, you have one minute. Thank you. So I think one of the things that I'm not hearing so far that's being spoken about is the mental health crisis that is affecting our students. This is a policy that could be brought to the board that has not been already brought to the board and discussed and data proven that it is working already. So the data already exists out there for policies from four years ago. What does not exist right now is looking at how our students are being affected by extremely high pressure society or societal norms upon them. I think the other policy that I would like to bring is affecting or addressing our teacher shortage. That is a national problem and it is very much affecting us here at home. So those are two policies that I wanna look at way more closely that have not gotten enough attention in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, um, and next we have Maria. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. There are a few things I would like to look at. Of course, detracking. Detracting has been one of the huge um, hot buttons, right, in our conversations. I've had conversations with parents and some students in regards to retracking. And I think that, yes, that we have to look at the data. The data says a lot. And right now, from the data that I've seen today, is that students that are in the current, are under the current policy, are doing better um, in, under the system that we have and the policies that we have right now. That's what I've seen. So I have to look at those numbers. I'm a data person as well, and I think that numbers speak a lot in volumes. We also have to think about, yes, I, I, I want all students to be in honors courses, right, if they, if they want to be in honors courses as well. But it goes in hand in hand also with mental health, right? Um, how much do we push and, um, you know, urge our children to take some of these honors courses? Also, I want to say about honors courses is that they're great, but they don't, if you want to, if the students want to be challenged and parents want their students to be challenged, I highly recommend that students take AP courses. I know that Menlo Atherton has over 25 AP courses. Oh, thank you, Maria. Your time's okay, up. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next we have Tonga. Thank you so much. Um, as my colleagues have shared, I, I think I echo them in saying that detracking is of course, an issue that I think we should just hit the ground running if elected. Um, it's not an easy conversation, but it's one that we need to have. Um, kind of my posture throughout this campaign has always been grassroots out. So I am very interested in building out a robust um, RFQ, RFP process. I do believe in the power of delegation, especially really pulling on our community who um, oftentimes are the experts and we're having topics around um, social identity and belonging, which um, I think primarily might be the reasons for detracking is how do we build authentic diversity on campus? Um, and so I know that the community um, can really help in, in kind of just having those conversations with students. Um, but detracking, absolutely. How do we get um, the community engaged in a, in a very real way? And oftentimes when we say real, we mean money. So thank you. Thank you, um, and lastly, we have John. Thank you. I would like to address um, and listen to the teachers. As an educator, I know that uh, teacher burnout is a real issue, especially in under-resourced schools. According to the district, um, nearly 60% of East Palo Alto Academy reports that teachers are struggling um, in these schools. And I would like to implement stronger teacher repetition and also including uh, mentorship programs for veteran teachers to reach down to, you know, uh, rookie teachers so that 
you know, teachers can uh, have a better and stronger impact on students. Thank you. Our next question is, one of the most important topics that has come to the board in the past year is detracking. In our candidate questionnaires, Mary Beth was the only candidate to oppose restoring removed classes, whereas the rest either were undecided or supported restoring those classes. For those of you who support restoring those classes, how do you respond to district data, which has shown increases in both AP enrollment and AP scores after students were in DTRAC classes? For those of you who oppose removing those classes, how do you respond to parents' concerns about limiting the opportunity of students who want to take these honors classes? And for those of you who are undecided, what information do you need to make a decision? Candidates will have 90 seconds to answer, starting with Jacob. SUHSD's goal of eliminating honors and AS classes was to increase later enrollment of underrepresented students in these advanced classes. And the data that the district has released shows that this is absolutely not the case. The same difference and the same shift that uh, th that we wanted to improve and help, the same disparity now just exists in 11th and 12th grade rather than 9th and 10th. Further, in terms of increased AP enrollment and increased grades and scores, we really need to examine which students are the cause for this increase. We don't have reliable data on whether this increase in, in enrollment is simply as a result of students that are already handed a lot of privileges performing well and taking even more of these honors and advanced classes and AP classes. And I think that we really need to help our students, which are underrepresented, and the data brought forward does not show that we're helping these students. And the way to help them is by really focusing on streamlining the transition between our feeder middle schools and our high schools. It's also by really focusing on our academic support and our academic advisors to ensure that all students are given the chance to take these classes. And all students, once they take these classes, are able to succeed. That is what's important, and it's extremely important that we really focus on the data that makes a difference rather than the data that keeps things the same. Thank you, Jacob. Now we go to Mary Beth. Well, and I want to clarify, the question that was, was asked is if you elect, would you support a motion to direct these honors classes? And these... I want to clarify that the district, nor myself, has no interest in removing any additional honors classes, AP classes, or AS classes. And the classes that were removed were, were one or two from the ninth and 10th grade curriculum, very, very specific reasons to increase the sense of belonging. And in the words of Sean Priest, let people find their people when they come to freshman year of high school. We put a lot of pressure on our students. And I know this as a high school principal because I see it every day. We put a lot of pressure on our students. And it's not just burnout on our teachers, it's burnout on our students. Because what good is a 4.0 in high school if you don't have the skills to handle the stress and perseverance by the time you get to college and you're burnt out by the time you get to college? And so I have no interest in removing any additional AP or honor courses. What I do think is that we look at data that has been given to us by Stanford, which I tend to trust most of the time. So an outside study by Stanford giving us this data that allows more exams to be taken, and not just more exams to be taken, but more fives and high scores to be achieved by our higher achieving students as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Daniel. I mean, clearly this is a charged topic and there's varying points of view and one could either embrace or question uh, the data. I think it's time to have a very open conversation. And for me, at least based on the feedback I've received from parents is people embrace the spirit behind what was trying to be done in context of lifting up another segment of our student body or our, our students. But at the same time, I think this is the classical two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, 
if we have a segment of, who are, of our students who are falling behind, we should be understanding why are they falling behind? What are the changes we need to make at those middle schools, junior high schools, to ensure that we are addressing that dynamic? And I'm very sensitive to the dynamic that Mary Beth brought up of like, we don't want students stressed out and burning out and we need to take that into consideration. But obviously we want them coming to high school with the appropriate skill set that so they can be comfortable, they can succeed and, and move forward in their student journey. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go to Tonga. Thank you so much. Um, I just have to be honest. <laughs> I am working in the feeder pipeline. I've been doing so for the past 10 years. And one of the main things that has really charged me to run for this is our literacy rates at Ravenswood Middle School. And I say this as someone who is dedicated perhaps more than I should, <laughs> um, given that I have a family, I have a husband, I have a daughter, to really the achievement of our students um, in East Palo Alto, not just at CCRMS, but everywhere. If you come out of East Palo Alto, you are advanced standing. And that's a cultural shift that needs to happen. And I think that for far too long, we have been missing from this conversation. And luckily enough, I bring a deep network of educators, of our community elders, the founder of our city, who oftentimes when he speaks, everyone listens. And I think that right now, especially in East Palo Alto, um, of course, in addition to B Bellhaven and North Fair Oaks, our city, we need a cultural shift. And I am someone, whenever I'm in at CCRMS, this, this would be year two of me working alongside um, our student aides and um, our teachers to help bridge this gap, this pipeline, um, because we want to make sure that we have our kids for nine years. We want to make sure that when they get to high school, that they're best prepared. And I love, Daniel, what you said, if that looks like investment for high school prep in East Palo Alto, then that's what it's probably going to take. Um, and I am a voice at the table that wants to have a very honest conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go on to John. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to be honest. Um, personally, um, in my education experience, um, I was a very late bloomer and um, I wasn't able to really appreciate my education until almost my freshman year of high school. Saying that, um, as a community coming from East Palo Alto, I felt the importance of hiring the bar of, for education and um, meeting students um, where they're at. Um, for example, as a teacher, um, I had a student that was able to uh, teach at the, was able to read at the ninth grade level, but the student was in the sixth grade. But I had other struggling students who were even reading at the sixth grade level. So I had to teach to students at all different types of levels, which is really difficult. So having the proper teacher training and support at the end of the day and uh, would really help uh, this aspect and um, adding more AP classes and giving our students uh, equal opportunity is, is the best for our students. Thank you. Next is Maria. Thank you. Um, as an educator myself, I, I have seen students in college coming in burned out already because they are stressed out in regards to having to take AP courses that they've taken and now they're in college, their mental health also in college is 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 really um, need, right? They need mental health and wellness uh, as well. Um, there's a lot of anxiety. And so I think that the policy, like I stated before, the policy that is in place right now, I think is good um, from what I see, but I think there's room for improvement. And the way that I think we can improve it is having these discussions, having open discussions, I think, with parents, teachers, uh, also students, right? How are students being affected inside these spaces? We need to know. Um, going on to retention and graduation, that's my. That's why I'm here. I'm here because I really want to close that gap, retention and graduation rates, especially for students from East Palo Alto and Ravenswood, right, and Menlo Park. Um, those numbers are high. Our retention graduation rates need to be better. How do you do that? Well, what's in place right now is that students who are freshmen, like my son, is able to take an elective, right? He's able to find something where he feels like he belongs. And if you're a freshman, whether you're in college or whether you're in high school, you find a place where you feel like you belong, and you will 
you will have better retention rates. There are higher, there are numbers, the numbers are higher and they show that in research. Research shows that freshmen in college or in, or in high school, if, they're reta- if they have a place where they belong, the retention rates are much, much higher and they will, they will you know, be, stay and, and find groups oh, where they thank belong. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, um, our next question touches on a sensitive but very important topic. Um, As students return to school this year, the Menlo Atherton community suffered a tragic loss of a student, putting a spotlight on student mental health. In a district survey conducted last school year, 42% of students said workload stress was always, almost always or frequently impacted their ability to complete assignments. How should the board be addressing student well-being? Um, We're going to start with John, and you have 45 seconds. Before you start, can you repeat what kind of stress? Oh, talking about um, workload stress. Workload, thank you. Yeah. Uh, We'll start with John. Thank you. Um, Workload stress, um, I think, I believe it goes hand in hand with mental health. And us putting mental health in the forefront and offering um, counseling service um, for students and teachers um, and and wellness services for for both of them. I feel like as a community, uh, we really need to put mental health in the forefront. Thank you. Um, Next, we are gonna move to Maria. Thank you. One of the other reasons that why I'm running is I think that we need to look at how we allocate funds to mental health. What are the things that we are doing right in the community towards mental health. I know that in Menlo Atherton, we have PAWS, right? In Menlo Atherton High School, and I think that's wonderful, but is that the same for Woodside? Is that the same for the other high schools? So I'm really dedicated and wanting to know more about how funds are allocated. What are some of the tools that we can do to help our students, the students in our community, to for better health and wellness overall for all students? That's where I stand, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're gonna go to Tonga. Uh, Thank you so much for the question. So back in January, Supervisor David Canepa was the first uh, to declare loneliness a public national crisis, first in the nation to do so. And literally 24 hours after that, we certified 14 of our community partners um, certified in mindfulness-based substance abuse treatment program. Um, through that program, we've been able to graduate the first cohort um, at Cesar Chavez Ravenswood Middle School. And this is just an example of what's happening at the grassroots. The things that we've been able to do kind of in addition to that is wellness retreats, summer camps, youth leadership development, and, and able to being able to offer those to students, I think requires some transparency. It requires some asking for funds from the county level um, to really build out a robust kind of mental health space for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next, we're going to move to Mary Beth. Hi, thank you. So this is a very personal uh, topic for me. And and three days ago, there's an alert system that pops up for the administrators at my high school. If a student were to search or Google um, something that could potentially cause harm to the community or themselves, and you can see what they searched right before that. And I got that alert at 8 o'clock at night. And right before that alert came to me, what they searched were their grades. Um, it, that's, that's what was causing them, that anxiety, that stress. Um, and so we need to look at the whole child. We, mental health is not just a counselor. It's not just a wellness space. Those are extremely important. But we need to look at everything that is affecting our young people and how to bring them up and support them as the whole child. Thank you. Okay, um, Daniel. No, I, I like what Mary Beth said about taking really a 360 view to the student experience. Uh, the stress that they feel as a freshman and sophomore trying to deal with their uh, school load, uh, assimilating into an, into a high school environment is probably very different than what they experience in their junior or senior year as they're now starting to prepare to go off to college and going through all that that, that takes. So I think you have to take uh, the mental wellness into account for both student and teacher. It needs to be situational. And we also need to reflect that we are many, many different cultures in this district. So there needs to be an aspect of how do we ensure that our counselors are being able to be empathetic from a cultural perspective as well. Thank you. Um, And last, we have Jacob. I think mental health is an enormous issue, but I really want to focus on specifically 
what we can do to help our students. During my senior year in high school in our district, my high school piloted a program of having trained and licensed mental health professionals on campus as a resource for all students. That pilot worked amazingly and we need to double down on making sure that all of our students have this opportunity. On top of that, there's a fundamental difference between the mental health of a student that leaves school and goes home versus a student that leaves school and participates in sports, arts, theater, music, etc., clubs. And I think it's incredibly important that as a district, we prioritize funding for all of those student opportunities so that our students can find a community that they're interested in and where they belong. Thank you. Our next question is, the Sequoia District spends roughly $24,000 per student, not including capital expenditures, and yet some students are told that they cannot take additional elective classes due to lack of funds. Do you think the district is spending its money appropriately, and do you think the board should focus on looking at fiscal waste? Candidates will have 30 seconds to answer. We'll start with Maria, followed by Tonga, and then John. Thank, thank you. As I stated before, yes, I want to be on this board because I want to see how funds are allocated, right? Where are they allocated? Um, who gets the big part of this portion of the funding, right? Where does it go? Um, and I definitely am wanting to know that, right? What's that process like? And I just want to remind that you can't do this by yourself. You're on a board. And so other members on the board have to be on the same page as you, hopefully, so that you can make real change. Um, so that's my answer to that. Like, I definitely want to continue to look at funding and how it's allocated and how we can help students and listen to their voice as well, right? What do they need? What are their needs? Um, so that they can take those extracurricular activities, right? Or the um, concerns in the strategic roadmap um, that was, um, well, anyways, that's time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. John? I Thank you. I feel that we need to relook at the budget and just relook at uh, the resources that are being distributed to make sure that funds are di being distributed di distribute equally and fairly to each and every school in our district. Um, we must look at things like bonds and parcel tax, um, things that can help power our schools and pay for salaries so the teachers can support themselves in this area. Thank you. Next is Jacob. During my time on the board last year as a student board member, I was at every single meeting and had the ability to really look at what is happening with our budget and where are we spending our money. And I was able to see that we have a huge cash reserve, and I think that our money and funds should be spent on our teachers and students and to really ensure that we're providing the best possible public high school education. We were entrusted with Measure W as a bond, and we really need to make sure that our oversight committee provides the best possible use of funds for our students and public and teachers and parents. Thank you. Next is Daniel. I did some quick math based on what you just said about 24,000 per student, assuming 9,000 students across the district, that's 216 million. Uh, I think any number that size requires transparency and, and accountability. And I said earlier in my comment, we are the fourth wealthiest county in the country. So there should always be a way to ensure that the resources that our students and teachers need, that those resources are available to them. Thank you. And last, we have Mary Beth. The joy of going last is you get all these great ideas coming at you. At, and so now you have to <laughs> put your things in place. Um, I, I think one thing to, to point out, um, as, as an executive director of a high school, I understand budget very well. And I understand that it's you actually, in a high school, you can't touch your reserves if it's something that you want to expand year to year to year. And I think what we're talking about is like bringing in more electives. Those are things we wouldn't want to just happen once a time. We'd want to create a system that is going to in last as long as those students want those. So that's what I'm thinking about. Ah, time. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, our next question is going to start with Tonga. Um, the current superintendent, Crystal Leach, entered her position after Darnice Williams resigned for unknown reasons. Um, superintendent Leach has faced criticism from parent groups, teachers, and community members for her handling of the district since taking office. Um, how do you feel about her tenure so far as superintendent? Um, you have 45 seconds, and again, we're starting with Tonga. Sure, thank you so much for that. Um, before I start, I want to say that I am currently right now getting my master's in communications, and so I understand how important it is to have good communications. With that being said, I think we all in the room know how volatile uh, the situation has been with um, kind of the turnover of superintendents and then also some of the things happening at the district. And so my recommendation would be to, and I know we just hired a public information officer, is to really build that pipeline of, of communications with the parents. You got to tailor it to your audience with the parents, the students, and then also the community. Um, because I think a lot of the criticisms, which I, I don't have any, unfortunately, but a lot of the criticisms I think should be kind of outlined and also um, offer a space for community to speak into that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to move to John. Thank you. At this moment, I don't have an answer for this question. Um, if you would like to, I do have a website. It's jbforschoolboard.com, and you can go to my website to look at that answer. Okay. Um, we will go to Maria next, 45 seconds. Thank you. One of the things that I am running on is transparency, and I think that the board and could have uh, handled that situation better, and transparency is key being able to talk to community members, being able to tell them what is happening and how this process works is so important. And so that would be my, my answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to move to Daniel. You know, I don't have any specific criticisms for the superintendent. I think what I would say is that the superintendent is the most senior person at that table, uh, independent of the trustees. So she, if there is a trust divide, which that's what, that's what I'm hearing and seeing, then she has to be accountable for how do she goes, goes about addressing that trust divide. And I think that that can span many, many of the issues that we've been talking to tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Beth? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm turn the mic on. Um, thank you. I, I think one of the things that I bring to the table is an outside perspective. At this moment, I don't have a, a child in the district. Um, I know high schools and I know education really well, but I get to see it from an outside perspective. And what I see um, is that the role of the board is, is really the, the what and, and not the how. So how I want to think about it is absolutely in alignment with, with both um, my, my peers said regarding transparency and communication. I do think that that could be increased and I also think that that role of the board to be the consultant with the superintendent is extremely important. I also am thinking in about it in the roles of any board, right? There's an idea of, of disagree and commit and that's on both education and professional boards and I think um, that can help us move forward together. Thank you. Jacob? I had the pleasure of collaborating and working extensively with Superintendent Leach last year. And I think that, uh, you know, she's doing an amazing job in a really tough district. And, you know, education is a tough space and it's tough to please everyone. And I think that um, uh, Superintendent Leach is extremely well-intentioned. And I also want to ensure that we're really working to understand community perspectives and working to respond to them. And I think that if there's a lack of trust and criticism in the community, it is our responsibility as board members, it is our responsibility as a school board to work with the community to really ensure that they feel heard and are able to dictate what happens with their kids and what happens with our public high school students. Thank you. We are on to our final question of this section of the forum. Um, the question is, last year, documentary filmmaker Eli Steele released a documentary titled Killing America that centered around Menlo Atherton High School in the Sequoia District. In the film, he brings up multiple issues, including detracking and an ethnic studies lesson presented at Menlo Atherton. Have you watched the documentary? And if so, what is your response to it and the concerns it raises? Candidates will have 45 seconds to answer, and we'll start with Mary Beth. 
So I've watched clips of it, but I think one of the things I'd love to talk about is how awesome it is that the Sequoia Union District before the state of California mandated ethnic studies, they did mandate ethnic studies. So I do think that that is a huge, a huge plus and a huge win. I, I do think that curriculum is extremely important and, and teachers need to be trained in, in, in subjects that, that can bring about emotions. But teaching hard history is absolutely something that the educators in our district should be able to do and should be able to train to be to be done. So where I'm going with this is is more about how do we support our teachers and staff to understand how to teach hard history and, and how to support all students. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jacob. I think that it's extremely important to note that there was a factually inaccurate lesson taught at Menlo Atherton that really broke a lot of the community trust. And I think that while you know we really need to emphasize and ensure that we're supporting our teachers as much as possible, we also need to ensure that we're listening to the community and listening to, to our parents and students that are speaking out. And one of the biggest issues and one of the biggest ways a school board can work to provide the best high quality public education for our students is by being aligned with our community. And I think there needs to be a lot of work done with transparency and with alignment in order to ensure that at the end of the day, our board and our community can collaborate together to create the best possible public high school education for our students. Thank you. Next is John. Thank you. I actually didn't get a chance to watch the documentary, but I've been hearing a lot of talks about this subject matter. And um, at the end of the day, teaching subject, um, teaching, uh, I want to not say hard, but factual truths in history is difficult for teachers to teach. And um, I feel like a, a remedy in this situation would be restorative justice for those students and doing restorative justice workshops who were impacted by this type of curriculum. I feel that curriculum harm is a true thing and it needs to be addressed. Thank you. Next is Daniel. I did see the movie at a children's event uh, last, last weekend. Uh, it is very troubling. Uh, it reinforces some of the things that I wrote in my guest op-ed uh, about a year ago when uh, parents in San Mateo proper brought to me artifacts of what was being taught at the San Mateo High School uh, District. And in doing further research, uh, I have come across other artifacts that are equally concerning. What I will say is I am very supportive of the philosophy behind ethnic studies, but I think the implementation in proven in the artifacts that are out there in the pu in the public domain, uh, really are going down a much different uh, path, and uh, that that is a bit of a red line for me. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. I am an ethnic studies professor, so I am an advocate of et ethnic studies, and um, I did not see that film, uh, so I cannot speak to that film. But I could speak to ethnic studies. Um, I am happy that my son will have ethnic studies in his high school. I didn't have ethnic studies until I ended up in college. So I really didn't get to see how my people, how the people that I grew up with contributed to this country, right? And so I think ethnic studies is, is um, a place where um, we can learn from each other. It's a place where we should learn from each other. We live in a diverse community, and it's and we have. I think it's beautiful that we're teaching our kids about what's happening around the world. So I'm a huge advocate of ethnic studies, and the teachers that teach it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and last, we have Tonga. Thank you for that question. Um, my undergraduate degree um, is actually in race and ethnic studies. And two days after graduating from University of Redlands, I started kind of this 10-year journey of serving my community. And what I had to go through actually was unlearning a lot of what I learned um, in race and ethnic studies because I realized that a lot of the language was harmful to my community when all they want to do is get a housing voucher. All they want to do is just get health care. Um, and so if elected, I will not constray from this um, being very critical about uh, the curriculum and how it's taught the delivery. I think, Daniel, you mentioned it, the implementation of it. 
Um, and also the district um, respectfully should not be doing all things that we can really delegate to the community um, who I think are the experts on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the moderator question round. We're going to take a brief five minute break to collect any questions. Um, if you would like to submit any, um, there are cards at the back of the room again with pens and you can fill them out um, and bring them to the front. Um, and those of you watching from home, you can submit questions through tinyurl.com slash sequoia dashboard.
Okay, we're gonna get started again. We're gonna go to the audience questions. Um, let's see. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, Area B candidate Jacob Yurev. Um, Jennifer's gonna ask the first question, and you have thirty seconds. Yeah. So our first audience question is: Technology has played an increasingly bigger role in education. What do you think is the best way to integrate? technology and what's your stance on the use of AI in the classroom? Absolutely. I think that we really need to embrace the fact that technology isn't going away and AI isn't going away. And rather than saying, you know, there's we aren't allowing AI into the classroom at all, we need to figure out how can we harness AI and how can we harness, harness technology to provide our students with the best possible education. Stanford is actually piloting a program where they're training an AI model on data from a classroom and on lectures from the classroom to teach students. I think this is a really interesting thing Thank to explore. Thank you. Um, and then we'll go to Daniel. Well, clearly as a former technology executive, I'm a big fan of us introducing technology into our schools, whether it be data sciences, uh, AI, machine learning, pharma tech, all of those I think have a role to play in our curriculum. Uh, that's the world we live in, and that's the world that's continuing to evolve in front of us. Thank you. Mary Beth? Yeah, absolutely agree with what my, my fellow zone beers have said over here. Um, that AI, I mean, at one point, what didn't we all, wasn't the calculator shunned? So, and then we have grown into our technology. And I, I would argue that the United States is actually not where we should be in terms of AI in the rest of the world. And considering that we are in Silicon Valley, I think that says that it's not a great look. And so, yes, I absolutely think we need AI and I need we need to teach students how to use AI. Thank you. Next is Maria. I agree. AI is where it is. I, as a professor, I have to grade, right? So I have to illustrate to my students how to uh, responsibly use AI, right? Um, and so I'm, I am an advocate of AI. I think it's, it is the future. It is what's happening right now. Um, and so, yes, I 100% I agree that, you know, SJSU is going into AI. Everything is AI right now. So just as long as our students um, use it responsibly, yes. And teaching them how is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Tonga? Um, so one of the things that uh, the city agreed upon when Amazon decided to come into the city um, on University and Bayshore was to have first source hiring. Um, the challenge, though, is that a lot of us in East Palto are not skilled um, on how to build or work with technology. And so on this question, I would say we would ha we have to start career readiness around AI because it's not going anywhere um, and it's going to be in our, in our community. So how do we strengthen or even introduce um, those classes and offerings for our students? Thank you. And last, we have John. Thank you. Um, I love STEM and I love technology. And I love it when it works in our favor. So uh, with that, um, having coding classes um, for high school students all four years would be really great for tech companies who need um, coders. Um, data science will also be important to us as well. We need to advance more in data science and, uh, and offer uh, STEM coding 
to, to all students because I feel like it's a skill that they're going to need to be successful in this area. Okay, um, our next question is also related to technology. Um, what is your stance on policies around restricting cell phone use in schools? This is also a 30 second question and we're gonna start with Daniel. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Uh, from what I understand, there are already some policies in, in place. I, I am supportive of their not necessarily being a, a cell phone being used or a mobile phone device being used while class is in session. Uh, and so that doesn't get in the way of whatever the curriculum is that the teacher is trying to, to get, get across. So some form of policy that allows for the student to have the phone for security and for things of that nature, but that during the class, the phone is not available or is not in use. Thank you, um, Mary Beth. Ooh, I love this topic. So last year as, as principal, I, I said I, I would like this to be a cell phone free school um, and teachers created their own systems. It, it didn't work. This year I said no cell phones during instruction time and the amount of engagement that has increased in the classroom. When we talk about teacher burnout, when teachers don't have to fight with phones, that's a huge plus, plus the mental health aspect of not being distracted all the time. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm for looking at this topic quite deeply. Okay, uh, Jacob. So I think that our primary purpose as a school district is to first teach our students and secondly to provide our students with a place to grow their social skills and I think phones both in and outside of the classroom really get in the way of that and it's really sad that as a school district we don't have a uniform school district wide phone policy restricting phones inside the classroom. I testified recently in front of our state superintendent Tony Thurmond on cell phone policy and I said that it's extremely important to take a look at phones both in and outside the classroom because they're extremely harmful. Thank you. Uh, Tonga, you're next. Um, you know, one thing, I have a four-year-old, so I know when I take away the phone, uh, I get tantrums and all that stuff, and I can imagine that that might also be true for our young people. And so taking technology, even the topic of technology is paired um, very tightly with mental health and behavioral health. And so I am, um, you know, of... The, the type to say that if we're gonna take phones away, we have to also give them tools on how to um, kind of build and, and kind of uh, navigate those emotions that come with out their phones. Okay, John. Thank you. Speaking of cell phones, just kidding. <laughs> They're distractions, we all know. So no on cell phones. Okay, Maria. Uh, definitely. As a high schooler, uh, my son was in high school. He tells me that he has to put his phone in some pocket in, before he starts school. And it is increased his attention so much more. I've noticed that with his reading, comprehension, so not having the phone in front of him at all times has been very helpful. It's also been very helpful for his mental health. I know that. Um, coming home, he leaves the phone away from him more often than, than none. So I am a huge promoter in, in keeping the phones away when they are learning. Um, thank you. Thank you. Our next 30 second question is, our district has vast diversity. Who do you see as your constituents? How will you ensure decisions and direction uplift all communities? We'll start with John. Um. I feel that um, when a community uplifts diversity and puts diversity in the forefront, the whole community wins. And we need people to take diversity by the horn and we can be the champion of it, but we need to take it seriously. We need to take programs like the DEI program and do a completely redo of that program so that teachers can feel that they're properly trained in this area. Thank you. Next is Maria. Can you repeat that question again, please? Just yeah. so I answer correctly. Of course. Our district has vast diversity. Who do you see as your constituents? How will you ensure decisions and direction uplift all communities? 
I think the decisions and, and being on the board, um, I know that in my area there's 64% Chicanx Latinx people. I am the first person to run on the board over 10 years that a Chicana Latina or identifies as such. Um, and I think representation is huge, not just for my community, but for all communities, right? I want to be there for everybody, all students. Um, and so that is my answer in regards to diversity in Thank community. Thank you. Tonga? Um, first and foremost, my constituents are uh, families, parents, and educators from East Palo Alto, Belhaven, and North Fair Oaks. And I want to make that clear because I think for a long time they've been absent from the conversation. Um, in addition to that, obviously, we sit on a board of diverse voices. Um, and so being able to contribute to the conversations with all folks, all students, all parents and educators in mind. Um, but I want to be very clear that my constituents are East Palo Alto, Belhaven, and North Fair Oaks. Thank you. Mary Beth? This is an elected position. My constituents are those that elect me, and that's going all the way from Redwood City to San Carlos, where I live, to, to Belmont. Um, I'm on the board, and I'm going to serve all of our students if my job in the board is to say, is this best for students? That's going to include everyone in the district. Um, but I absolutely know the, of who I am elected and, and who I serve as well. Um, and I serve all of our feeder schools as well. And I think about that as, as well. Thank you. Next is Jacob. I really learned during my time as a student board member last year that your responsibility as a board member is to serve every single student and to serve every single community member in the district. And I think that while uh, my area B constituents will elect me, my responsibility as a board member is to provide the best education for area B parents and children to area C, A, B, C, D, E, to everyone, to ensure that every single student has the most high quality education. Thank you, and last we have Daniel. I would just amplify what my colleagues have said. Uh, we're, we're here to serve the students and uh, the, the community. We need to embrace the diversity with which we live in and ensure that we are lifting up all students and giving them all the opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question is also 30 seconds. Um, two years ago, two guns were found on MA's campus. What should the district be doing to address weapons on campus? We're gonna start with Maria. Well, um, of course I am uh, against guns and I am for safety for all students. Um, and I believe that the district and the community needs to come together and have real discussions on what that means on campus, right, and off campus, and how um, this is handled on campus and off campus, right? Um, so i definitely a proponent of keeping our students safe, keeping the community safe, um, and that is my answer to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next, we have Tonga. Um, I just want to echo Maria. I am... I champion a public safety, community safety, campus safety. And one of the things that I would love to see is how our local police departments can really speak into some of the training that might be provided during professional development days for teachers. Not that teachers have already enough on their plate, um, but also kind of earlier um, alluding to building out an RFP, RFQ pipeline and process to really engage the community on and really speaking into this. Um, more often than not, we find ourselves in spaces after the fact when students have been expelled, suspended. Oh, that's your Get time. it, got it. Thank Thanks. you, Bye. sorry. Okay, John. I felt that with, with that with gun safety, um, students are our number one concern. Their safety is our number one concern. And to have guns on campus is unacceptable. And uh, most guns come from parents, so we need to also have, a, you know, a student-led initiative telling parents, hey, lock your guns up. Take it seriously because it can happen to every any school. So I take it very seriously, and um, that's my time. Thank you. Uh, Jacob. 
Student safety is one of me and my campaign's absolute priority. I'm extremely proud to be endorsed by former Belmont Police Police Chief Dan DeSchmidt, and I think that it's incredibly important that we have student resource officers on campus that work with our schools and work with our administration to ensure that our students are always safe, and I'm really proud to be trusted by our Belmont and Area B community to ensure that this is the case and to ensure that student safety is an absolute priority. Thank you. Daniel? I guess I will also echo what everyone just said, that uh, student safety, educator safety, and anyone else working in the school system is paramount. Uh, people should not go into the schools and feel threatened in any way, shape, or form. Weapons of any kind don't belong in the school. I think we need to have school resource officers, but I think, as some of my colleagues said, parents need to be very aware of what the code of conduct is and there needs to be a contract with those parents to understand that they have a role to play in ensuring the school is safe. Okay, and last we have Mary Beth. Yeah, um, kind of piggybacking on what Dan said, and I can drop the being an educator in the state of California at a public school, there's something called the big five. And those are the five things that no matter what you do in a public education, the your administration has to recommend you for expulsion and having a weapon a gun on campus is one of them. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to do, and this is what I agree with Daniel, is the sort of the 80-20 rule in terms of the response make sure that those expectations and the consequences that follow are super crystal clear to students and caregivers at the very beginning and continue that message throughout the year. Thank you. And for our last 30 second question we have, during this forum, some of you have talked about the importance of transparency in the district. Can you provide some transparency on how your campaign is funded? We'll start with Tonga. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> Um, Self-funded, still under 2,000, and we're, we're going. We're, we're going strong. Thank you. John? Currently on a shoestring budget, but, you know, making it happen. Thank you. Maria? I am 100% self-funded. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Daniel? Ditto that, 100% self-funded. Great, thank you. Mary Beth? I am running a grassroots campaign and I have the support of so many educators and parents and volunteers uh, in my community who are supporting myself. My husband and I are also supporting this because we understand how important this is. Um, so all the, the, the finances are coming directly from the community with the majority of them coming from educators and former and current board leaders. Thank you, and last we have Jacob. As an 18 year old, I sadly don't have the privilege of self-funding, but I'm extremely proud to say that I'm funded almost exclusively by constituents and other community members within our Sequoia Union High School District. And at the end of the day, I know that my main priority if elected is to serve all of our students and all of our parents and community members. And I'm extremely glad to say that I'm supported and funded by a lot of our community members across the school district. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move to a 45 second question. Um, Carlmont is one of the few schools that still has AS English one, while MA and Woodside uh, still, sorry, is one of the few schools that still has AS English one, uh, well, MA and Woodside don't have it. <laughs> what is your position on uh, uniformity across schools with regard to course offerings? Um, we're gonna start with Mary Beth, it's 45 seconds. The district already doesn't have uniformity when we think about um, what what electives are taken at different classes, what um, Carlmont has AP, Sequoia has IB. So I, I think this is the diversity of the different school, di uh, the, the different sites. And again, knowing that the we are the, the board is the the what, not the how, I think the school sites have a should have a lot of that autonomy on how best to serve the students that are in their community. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, Daniel. You know, it's hard to speak about the different alphabet soup. Uh, I would say that I would want to ensure that every school in the district has similar opportunities, but the, to Mary Best's point, those opportunities meet, need to be tailored 
to the student body and make sure that the students are receiving what, what, what they need, that we shouldn't be taking anything off the table, that we should give, be giving them as many options as possible. Okay, um, next we're gonna move to Jacob. I think that the diversity in our school district is an absolute strength, but I also want to note that I want to ensure that the level of opportunity available to our students does not depend on where you live and where you reside and what the median household income in the city that you live is. I want to ensure that while our schools can have different opportunities, the level of opportunity is the same in every single school in our district. And I think the first thing that we need to do in order to ensure that happens is to work with our high schools, work with our school sites to ensure that there is at least some level in uniformity in terms of the resources and the academics and course offerings that our students in all of our high schools are able to use and indulge in. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move to John. Thank you. Um, I feel like it's a problem of equity at the end of the day and that each school should offer the same um, amount of services for our students because our students deserve quality education at the end of the day. Thank you, Maria. I think that each school has a different population of diversity, yes, um, but I think that it should be, every school should have its own autonomy on what they choose and how they choose to do it. If in an equal level at all levels, right? But so, yeah, that's my answer to that. Thank you, Tonga. Um, I just wanna correct myself from the earlier question. Um, I am not self-funded, shoestring budget still, um, but very much supported by the community. Um, and then on the topic of uniformity, I think that it's beautiful that every school site has its own flavor to it. And it's definitely not something that I wanna stop, um, perhaps, for the district, there might be some light oversight, um, especially around sensitive topics on race and ethnic studies. Um, but no, I am not for uniformity um, across all school sites for the most part. Thank you so much. I think those are all of the questions that we have for you today. Um, now we will allow the candidates to give one minute closing statements. Um, and we'll start with John. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, running for school board could be a, a daunting uh, experience. And um, going through this experience, I've learned so much about myself. And I've also learned so much about my community. And with that, I want to encourage more young people to get out there and, you know, support and also uh, be a part of this political process because uh, we all have to start at some point. And this is my starting and I wanna appreciate everyone for being here and thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, thank you for having me here. This has definitely been an experience for myself as well, first time running. I'm a first generation Chicanx Latinx woman who is running on the board. Um, first generation, for, I mean, first person in my family to get a BA, MA, and then PhD, which is a huge feat for my family and my ancestors, right? I have come from a low-income family. Uh, I am a higher ed um, uh, advocate. I've been in higher ed for over 20 years, um, and I love teaching, and this is the reason why I wanted to come be part of the board so that I could illustrate that um, I could bring my skills uh, to the table in regards to higher ed, retention, graduation rates, especially for underserved communities. Um, and to illustrate to young folks that um, if you want to make a change, you can you can run and you can do something like this too, um, especially in, in the area that I live in, East Palo Alto, and the constituents around my space. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Tonga. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you so much, the Almanac, for hosting us once again. Um, and I want to reiterate kind of my positioning and also what I bring to the table. Um, I have been working in the feeder pipeline for over well, nearly 10 years now and um, really built 
and implemented programs, um, and then also community partnerships. I think, especially in this election cycle, there's so many people running for City Council of East Palo Alto. We have two of my own mentors running for San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. And so there is a lot of opportunity here to really streamline and shift the culture in East Palo Alto, which is something that I want to focus on on day one is that our students are advanced standing, our students are excellent, and they can achieve with the support of our community, our parents, um, and what that looks like, imagining and exploring that, I think is the fun part for me. So I wanna say thank you so much everyone for being here, and um, please check out my website, thelmavictoria.com. Thank you, bye. Thank you, next is Mary Beth. Thank you so much for hosting tonight, this has been this has been fun. As a lifelong educator with almost over 15 years of education, I'm, I'm really truly honored to have the trust and endorsement of a lot of key leaders and educators and parents and community members. Um, I have the support of everyone from Congressman Kevin Mullen, former state senator Jerry Hill, the SDTA Teachers Union supports me, the APA Caucus, not to mention former and current board members, not just from the Sequoia Union High School District, but also from all of our, all of our feeder district boards as well. And what this widespread support means from our leaders, from teachers, from community members, from parents of both children in the district and out, is that people who do this work and understand the importance of education know that I am the right person for this job and know that I am qualified to do this job. So together we can ensure that every student in our district thrives. Thank you. Oh, and check out my website. <laughs> thank you. Next is Daniel. I also want to thank you all for being here and for the Almanac for, for hosting us uh, tonight. I think what you've heard from all of us is that we are here for the kids and to ensure that our students are st striving and being able to navigate this ever-changing and uh, complex world. I also think that there's probably more that unites us on this stage than divides us in context of, of, of the issues. As someone who's coming, this is maybe as an outsider, uh, coming from, coming from the, the business world, I feel like I bring a unique set of skills, having led large organizations, having separated companies, having merged companies, uh, having had thousands of employees, managing a budget with bees in front of them, uh, and having solved complex problems. Uh, so I'm going into this with my eyes wide open, but I do think that I bring a very can-do, pragmatic, unbiased, data-driven approach uh, to the role of trustee, and I hope that I will secure your confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Last, we have Jacob. Thank you so much for everyone here. I want to go over the California School Board Association's definition of a school board member. They say the role of a school board member is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of their communities. I think we've slightly lost sight of that, and I'm running to ensure that we regain the sight of our priorities and of our community again. I want to state that I'm the only Area B candidate with experience serving on the board as a student. I've done the job, I understand the budget, and I've asked the tough questions. I have deep roots within the community and am a product of our public high school system. I want to bring my perspective to bear as we make policy decisions, and I want to ensure that we're making decisions based on data, facts, and student and family concerns, as opposed to emotion or political pressure. I hope that we can work together to create the best possible public high school system for our students. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you to our six candidates for participating in our forum. Um, for more of our election coverage, go to our website, almanacnews.com slash election. A recording of this forum will be... What happens with the rest of the questions? We read that was submitted even Yeah, we received about how many thirty questions. So we we screened and, and went through uh, and so could only like ask a little. Avoiding asking certain questions that our community wants to have a discussion on. Is that what's happening? No, we have a limited amount of time, and so we so can schedule until eight p.m. Till seven thirty. We're about to conclude. 
Um, the candidates are here, and um, I'm sure that they would be available to answer some of your questions personally. Um, okay, um, our publisher, Adam Doss, is going to close things out for us. Yes, I want to reiterate thanks to all of the candidates and to all of you for coming out tonight. And a special thanks to our moderators, Jennifer and Angela, for doing such an excellent job in preparing really probative questions uh, for the candidates. I, I feel much better educated on all of the issues and all of their stances on the issues. So I hope you do too. Um, I have final message, and that is that local news across this country is in crisis. For the last 20 years, more than two publishers have gone bankrupt and closed their doors, and that is a massive uh, impact on how democracy happens at the local level. We live in a very wealthy community where we have lots of resources, but these trends that have affected local news nationwide affect us as well. So if you appreciate the content that we were able to create for you in the community tonight, if you appreciate all the content and information and reporting that we do for the other 11 months of the year, I can't urge you more strongly to support us and uh, allow us to continue to provide high quality local news for these communities. So if you, the best way to do that is to become a member if you're not a member already. If you are a member, we would greatly appreciate it if you'd consider providing a donation for us. We, we became a nonprofit to help the community support us better as we go forward. And if you're interested in either, there's information at the back as you exit. So thank you all very much for coming tonight. And good luck uh, to all the candidates in November. And I hope you all feel better informed making your choices.